Hey everybody, welcome to yet another journal club brought to you by Life, Ex Ex Life Extension Advocacy Foundation and Lifespan.io. So I'm Oliver Medvedic broadcasting as usual from the Cooper Union, where um, very soon, in about three weeks or maybe a little more than three weeks, in July 11th and 12th, we'll be having a huge conference um, related to the biotechnologies uh, directed towards health span extension and um, the basic research that underlies uh, aging and longevity. So please, um, you know, uh, look at our website to, you know, stay tuned for, um, I guess we have our, our speaker lineup already locked in. So take a look at the, you know, what's, what's going on. Um, do buy a ticket if you can, and uh, please join us um, at our venue. Uh, today's journal that we'll be discussing is a, um, a clinical trial, another small clinical trial, uh, we covered one um, on a plant polyphenol, uh, Visidin, a while back from the Mayo Clinic. And this is kind of in a similar vein, but this is a different plant compound that is extremely promising. Um, it's a plant compound, it's a derivative of plant compounds, uh, Urolithin A, which um, is derived from, um, probably going to garble the name here, but basically from a class of plant polyphenol compounds called epigallatins, I think which are um, uh, found in pomegranates, high concentration, but uh, they're also found in a lot of other fruits. And uh, they have a huge um, range of health benefits. Um, I'm going to pull up a paper later to kind of show you all the you know, pathways that get activated. But basically, they you know, act as they initially garnered interest as antioxidants, as Fizidin did, but they were later found to have a number of other um, attributes, anti-inflammatory um, attributes, uh, so on and so forth, anti-tumor you know, tumor attributes, basically a lot of, you know, they target a lot of things. Um, and this paper here, and I'm going to pull it up right now, here on the screen, is a nature metabolism paper. Um, the mitophagy activator urolithin A is safe and induces a molecular signature of improved mitochondrial and cellular health in humans. So this is a study. Um, it's a double-blind placebo um, study with healthy, sedentary, elderly individuals. So they look at um, not only safety, but also what I've been harping on for a long time, bioavailability. Does it actually get into the bloodstream, you know, and do these things? And the answer is yes. Uh, so urolithin A is actually quite bioavailable um, and it's got a great safety profile. And what they look at, it's a, you know, it's a short range trial. Um, and I'm going to, so when I say urolithin A, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and I'm going to pull up another, if I can find it, um, I bookmarked it. Oops, pull this up. Um, click, click, click. PDF. Uh, yes. All right. Zoom, 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 zoom. Share screen. So this is a review paper um, that is not behind a paywall. Biological significance of urolithins to gut microbial elagic acid drive metabolites. The evidence so far. So this is this is kind of interesting. You can't go into the store right now and buy urolithin A, right? Um, it's actually, um, see, these are related compounds. So these are these three ringed structures. That's urolithin A up here. There's other forms of it. I think urolithin B. I'm going to scroll through and show you kind of a whole bunch of other molecules here. And so when you eat fruits, you, they don't contain this urolithin A, which was this active compound that the study was looking at. They contain these compounds, a class of elagitanins, um, Elagic acid being one of them, and you can see that they look quite a bit different, have some extra rings, and they actually get converted to this active compound. Um, and then this gets later processed by having some carbohydrate moieties attached to it later in, in your bloodstream. But these conversions, and this is kind of the interesting thing, when you when you eat these plants, these conversions happen in your gut microbiome. Um, and they mention this in the paper. Uh, that we will be going today, going over today. So when, so they really did a lot of great work, and this paper is um, sponsored 
or I guess the scientists are from a company called uh, Amazantis, and they want to market. They want to put urolithin A on the market, um, precisely as I, I believe as an anti-aging compound. With you know, since it has um, a lot of good things going for it, um, and. What I found intriguing, there was a lot of papers that were published before this showing that, you know, pomegranate juice and pomegranate extracts seem to have a, you know, a, a really good health effect for a lot of people, but not for others. And there's a lot of variability. And it's really this variability, it seems that it's, it's focused on the, the variability of the gut microbiomes between different individuals. And I'm pulling up some numbers from the paper here. Um, and I'm going to pull up and share my screen here. Uh, Get back to the paper. So um, this is by Andrew et al. And it just came out. It's a pretty recent paper, um, June 2019. So this month. Um, this is just the protocol for the for the procedure. I'm gonna scroll through this. Um, Scroll through stuff that we're going to go back later. Uh, let's see, where is this? Uh, oh, yeah, here. So you probably, I'm just going to highlight this. Um, the levels of total UA, so um, the uh, urolithin A and its metabolites, um, you know, the, the, like the glycosylated variants that are found in the plasma, blood plasma. The four dosing and enrolled subjects range from an undetectable, so 69% of the subjects didn't have any detectable UA. Um, 17% had, had a detectable amount in their blood. 11% of the people had a moderate level and 3% had a high level. And you can, if you read through the paper, they purposely screened people who weren't taking supplements or anything like that to skew this. So, you know, they were eating, they were sedentary, normal people eating, you know, I guess your recommended daily dose of fruits and vegetables, whatever. Um, so evidently, and I, I guess it'd be really interesting and I'm sure people are going to do much more um, research into this. Uh, evidently, this, you know, the hypothesis is that this very variability, and I don't know what percentage of this variability, maybe a huge percentage of it, is due to a difference in perhaps the gut microbiomes of these people. <clears throat> and a particular microbe uh, was actually identified from the gut, mi gut microbiome. Um, I don't have the name of it. Uh, let me actually, let me actually do. Ah, I think it's Gordonibacter, no, Gordonibacter urolithin, urolithin fashion, right? So that's, that's one of the bacteria that were isolated from the human gut microbiome that actually um, catalyzes, you know, um, the conversion of those precursor compounds that are found in pomegranates to, um, to the active urolithin A. So, you know, the bottom line is perhaps, you know, if you're eating lots of these fruits, you, you know, you, you might be the unlucky cohort of people that doesn't have the right microbiome to, to, you know, get all the maximal health benefits from these fruits, right? Because, uh, and some people do. So that kind of adds a lot more complexity to, you know, to kind of like our, how, you know, our healthy diets uh, can be comprised, right? So I just want to point that out there because this is, um, again, more data that, that, shows us that our microbiome, our gut microbiome plays so many roles in, you know, not only just processing um, pharmaceutical drugs that we ingest into different, you know, um, metabolites, but, uh, but also compounds that we eat from fruits and, and vegetables that um, maybe certain people have the wrong micro, gut, gut microbiome to, you know, get the active ingredient out. Um, so what this paper does is, and what this company is doing, is trying to just bypass all of that and say, let's just have the active final compound, urolithin A, and put that into a diet and see what happens, see what works. So um, I was reading message boards, you know, before I, I started reading this paper and people were, you know, trying to come up with ways around it, right? Could you have a probiotic that you mix in with the, one of the microbes that converts the precursor compounds? Um, like elagic acid, for example, um, and converts it into urolithin A, and then you can take take that mixed with your pomegranate extract. Perhaps, maybe, I don't know. Um, nothing like that exists on the market. And unless you go to a chemical supply company, urolithin A doesn't exist on a market um, for the consumer. Um, there are 
pomegranate extracts and stuff like that, but I just told you what the potential problems of that are. Um, of course, if you've got the right mi gut microbiome, then perhaps taking a high dosage pomegranate extract will work. Okay, so let's go back to sharing the screen. So this is a clinical trial. Um, you know, it's like a multi-phase trial. They used high dosages, um, and I'm not going to go too much into detail here, except that they had, you know, several cohorts of people, and they were looking at, you know, so they had kind of two different um, components in this trial. One was like a multiple ascending dose, and one was a single ascending dose, meaning that they had different cohorts of people, cohort 1A, cohort 2A, cohort 3A, you know, and you had eight people in each of these groups, Two people were a placebo, six were taking the dosage, and it was unknown who was taking what. Um, so these were different groups of people, if I'm reading the protocol correctly. So at the end of each of these dosages, so taking 250 milligrams, I believe that was daily. We'll take a look at the, you know, and this was in a capsule form. So it was in a, they said it was in a soft shell. So I don't know exactly the, what was in the soft shell besides the urolipin or what sort of emulsion or what sort of mixture they had it in. Um, and then they did a, a safety profile at the end, right? Um, did anybody drop dead after one week? Um, well, they were much more finer than that, right? So they looked at blood, you know, they looked at lipid profile. They looked, looked at, you know, uh, a variety of, you know, they looked at blood glucose levels. They looked at, uh, they looked at EKG readings. They did a lot of things at the end of the week one, make sure it was safe. Things were safe. People are okay. They, week two, I think this was a different cohort and the dosages went up to a thousand. And then, and then, um, after this period, you know, the dosages were also then given at higher all the way up to 2000 milligrams. And then they did muscle biopsies for the 2000 milligrams. So the muscle biopsies, they were doing quantitative PCR to see what happens to mitochondrial function, um, as well. Right. So basically what they were looking at in this paper, stop sharing is safety profile is going up to 2000 milligrams going to be bad acutely for anybody? The answer is no. Um, is your mitochondrial function going to change? Um, to kind of jump the gun here, I'm going to say, yes, it did. The, you know, the mitochondrial profile did change for these individuals. Um, and that's basically what they were looking at in this paper. They weren't looking at any other parameters. They weren't looking at physiological parameters. They weren't looking at they mentioned in this um, paper that uh, I think certain physiological parameters might manifest much later, like three months later or something. So they, this was a much shorter term trial, so they weren't looking at that. So again, they were looking at safety and mitochondrial parameters that correlate with uh, increased efficiency and health of mitochondria, right? Um, and like I said, urolithin A, if you go into the literature, does all targets a lot of different things. So they were just focused on mitochondria because, you know, problems with mitochondria is, you know, dis, they mentioned that, you know, dysfunction of autophagy, autophagy and mito, mitophagy, I believe that's how it's pronounced. Mitophagy, as we get older, goes down, right? So if you can increase that, then that's better for an elderly individual. So share screen. Okay. So what they were looking at here, and this is, you know, and this is good. Um, so figure B, 1B is basically looking at um, urolithin A. So time after urolithin A administration. So these are oral administrations. Um, UA, it's normal. That's, that's what they gave people. UA, uh, glucuronidae and sulfate. Those are forms of, so after it goes into your bloodstream and goes through the liver, it gets converted to these, to these variants that float around. Um, so these are just the profiles, 250, 500,000 milligrams. So you can see that they peak around six hours, right? So, and the dosage kind of tapers off. And after 96 hours, it, it sort of gets back to, um, you know, gets down to zero or whatever um, the baseline was for individuals. So pharmacokinetics, looking at bioavailability, um, is crucial. So, you know, that's something that they paid attention to in this paper. And um, I kind of like, I, I really like seeing that because it, whatever formulation they gave it is actually getting into the bloodstream, right? And, and it's peaking. So 
Um, you know, even dosages down, down to 250 milligrams. And, I, and what is interesting is that when they look at, um, look at the effects of these compounds, it appears that for some of the effects uh, that they looked at for, you know, um, mitophagy, factors that are correlated with mitophagy and autophagy, um, they didn't see any effects at 200, that were significant, 250 milligrams. The threshold seemed to be 500 milligrams and up, right? Um, which is not a big deal because, again, safety profile seemed to be excellent. Um, at least they mentioned it for, you know, at every stage of the, of the process. And I believe urolithin A, looking at the molecule, it's probably pretty cheap. Um, so for mitochondrial function, what they were looking, one, one kind of parameter is the processing of, um, of these, as, these as, oh, sorry, sorry, acyl carnitines, right, which are these fatty acids that um, enter, um, enter the mitochondria and they go through fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation. So if you have increased fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation happening in mitochondria, you have lower levels of these acyl carnitines that base, so they're basically, so this is in the plasma, right? So as they drop, they're entering mitochondria reportedly, right? So this is placebo. Um, this is full change D28 over D minus one. D minus one is like the day before the administered the trial. D28 is 28 days after the trial. Um, and they're looking at, uh, so these are just different chain links of, of the, um, of the uh, fatty acid chains. And so if you have a drop, and these are the, just the statistical significances, you know, the shorter chain ones tend to drop much more um, significantly. I don't know why there's a certain dip here happening with placebo. Um, that's kind of interesting. But for a, quite a number of these, when they kind of do the uh, statistical analysis. So this line here is kind of the threshold, this dotted line. You have a lot more of them, basically. It correlates with the amount of milligrams that are being dosed with people. So UA at 500 milligrams and then UA at 1,000 milligrams. You have a lot more of them, you know, um, dropping in, uh, in the plasma levels. So evidently, these acyl uh, carnitines are entering mitochondria, and that's that's basically shown. You know, that's uh, an established, I guess, test for fatty acid metabolism in mitochondria. There's a lot of variation here, and the interesting thing is, um, they do again. I mentioned earlier that some people might have a you know different gut microbiome. And that may correlate with higher baseline levels of, of UA, which they certainly showed early in the, in the paper. Um, I don't know. I didn't deep dive into the supplemental. So I don't know if they, they tried to correlate those higher baseline levels of, you know, I don't know how, you know, how deeply they looked at uh, baseline levels of UA in the bloodstream of people, you know, that were taking additional supplementation in UA and if this can correlate with, um, this variation that you see here. Um, but the bottom line is, is that, you know, the drop in acyl carnitine fatty acids in plasma um, is correlating with increasing dosages of UA. So that's their, that's their take home message here. Um, okay. So there's really one more figure here. Um, and there's a lot more stuff in supplemental that we won't get through, but I'm just going to put this, this is basically kind of a ge genome wide study. I'm going to stop sharing here, take a little breather in case people have questions. Um, but the rest of the paper basically looks at, um, is our genes upregulated that correlate with, with, you know, enhanced mitochondrial function, right? Or, or, or genes that correlate with mitophagy and autophagy, do they go up? Um, I'll go back to the figure. I mean, the summary is, you know, a lot of them do. It's correlated with increased dosages of urolithin A, particularly with a thousand milligrams. Um, and, you know, the answer is yes. So let's go back here. So just kind of looking at this heat map here. So this is from their trial, um, placebo, 
you're lifting a 500 milligrams, you're lifting a 1,000 milligrams. Here's a whole panel of genes um, that are correlated with gene expression, right? Um, high levels in red, low levels in blue, with, with basically a panel of genes and how they get expressed. So I believe that these are genes, um, I want to say, uh, yeah, that are associated with mitochondria. Um, so not mitochond not genes in mitochondria because there's only a small amount of them, but you know genes that express factors that are required for mitochondrial function. Um, for example, like you know um, the electron transport chain, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and you can see here that you know here here's a control. So this panel here is from a database. So sedentary pre-fail, pre-frail, sorry, pre-frail people, um, and. The people that they shed, they chose for the tri their trial um, fit the kind of the cat the same category as kind of in the databases for sedentary pre frail right. So these are the same cohort of people that were later taking these high dosages of UA. So just by looking at this, you you can see a difference, right? I mean, you can see that there's a, a lot of these genes are going up, um, going up in expression. Um, this is an active, healthy person, right? So there's certain correlation with some of these genes that correlate with an active, healthy person um, that you are seeing with a high dosage of urolithin A at 1,000 milligrams. Um, I think this is, yeah, this is after 28 days of treatment, right? Um, the rest of these are basically looking at, you know, quantitative PCR messenger RNA of, you know, placebo, UA 500 milligrams, UA 1,000 milligrams of, you know, uh, genes that are required for mitochondrial biogenesis. So you can see this gene, PGC1A, seems to really go up. Um, fatty acid oxidation. Um, this bar graph here, I think it's a summary of these graphs here. So basically normalized enrichment score. So you get an, an enhanced part of basically genes that are correlated with you know, the genes that play a role in mitochondrial matrix and, you know, and this is mitochondria overall. Um, so the rest of these, you know, you, you get more of an expression if you used a high dosage, 1000 milligrams versus 500 milligrams. So one thing that they didn't, that they said looked like it was trending. So clearly this looks like a trend, but they said this wasn't statistically significant was that, you, you know, the number, overall number of mitochondria didn't go up. Um, I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting to, to, to do my, more studies. I would say more, maybe more fluorescence microscopy to see what happens with mitochondria as you, as you do this, uh, this high dosage application, um, and apparently also linked to biogenesis, biogenesis, biogenesis. Yeah. The genes are apparently linked to that. So, so they were saying, okay. So Why is it it would uh, suggest multiplication or, uh, of the um, the mitochondria. Yeah, perhaps. Which yeah. is good, right? You know, more mitos equals good, right? Yeah, and if you have more mitochondria, evidently it's healthier mitochondria if they're replicating. Mm -hmm. um, on the heat map, why do you think administered 500,000? Why not lesser dose or more? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean... I don't know exactly what, there's a lot that's not known. Like, I don't know what are all, what are all the targets uh, for urolithin A. Um, you know, not only does urolithin A need to be bioavailable in the blood, but it needs to actually then get into the cells and then perhaps get into the mitochondria. It depends on, you know, I mean, obviously if these are nuclear uh, genes, which I think most of them are, uh, it perhaps needs to get into the nucleus. Um, I don't know what all factors, you know, so, and, and, and of course the binding constants for all of these different factors are going to be different. So if you go up and up in an up dose, you're targeting more factors. If you go lower and lower in a dose, maybe certain factors that have a, a much smaller dissociation constant are going to get targeted first by urolithin A, right? And it's going to hit a, a smaller subset of things. But so that's just my hand wavy response to, you know, to that. Um, yeah. 
So that's going to complicate things. Um, I think the bottom, the bottom line that's very um, good here is that going up with high, high doses, you don't see a negative effect, right? Well, at least we're not seeing in this, this short trial that like there's not this little window that we have to worry about where, you know, below 250 milligrams, nothing happens. After 500 milligrams, you drop dead, right? So we don't, we're not worrying about that. It just seems that the more, the merrier, at least up to 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams in for, for four weeks or however long this, you know, these different trials was were. So I, the safety profile seems to be quite excellent. So, um, so you know, we can, we can start at kind of a high end and then keep moving up and see if there's a, a certain saturation effect, which no doubt there will be at, at some point. Um, but we don't seem to, we're, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem to be any kind of major toxicity worries is kind of my point here. For, so for practical reasons, that's, that's very, pro, very promising. Right. I wonder if you would combine your lithium A with uh, nicotinamide ribose side, if what well, that will produce. Yeah, it. yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's something you know that we touched on the earlier papers that we had in these journal clubs, right? Like looking at C. elegans, where they 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 looked at orthologous pathways and pathways that might also interact, and showing that certain factors that target multiple pathways might synergize for the lifespan in C. elegans, and you know, and I mentioned C. elegans also because one of there was an earlier earlier paper that uh, before they did this work here, they, they tested urolithin A also on C. elegans. I'm not sure if it was the same group. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these compounds that have excellent safety profiles, um, like nicotinamide riboside, urolithin A, fisidin, right? I mean, why not, why not come, you know, if they're targeting things that are in different pathways, but have some overlap, you would expect to see uh, some sort of additive or synergistic effect. Um, and the intriguing thing about that one C. elegans paper that we went over was the, there did not appear to be any negative synergy. Um, I don't know what the term for negative synergy is, uh, but whatever it is, they didn't, they didn't have any negative synergy. Like, right, adding two compounds that were working on orthologous pathways didn't make the worm, worm worse, right? It either didn't do anything or it got better. Well, yeah, it's still a synergy, isn't it? I mean, a synergy yeah. just, just indicates something that works together. That's true, yeah, yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. I mean, you know, dynamite and, and, and lit matches, I understand, is a synergy. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to put them to, uh, together unless you're blasting uh, a rock face, right? Exactly. So anyway, the synergy that was observed with, with at least at least in C. elegans with compounds that targeted, you know, orthologous pathways, but work, all of them working at for the end goal of promoting lifespan extension had a positive effect that, you know, it didn't, didn't make the worms worse. So I know it's a bit of a stretch extrapolating from C. elegans to humans, but hey, that's research, right? So um, I, th I think, I think all signs point to, sure, let's, let's try multiple compounds that, uh, that have an excellent safety profile. They mentioned here that I think they Urolithin A has already been in, been given the nod as generally recognized as safe by by the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. So, it's um, <clears throat> I mean, as a supplement, I would I would think that you know this is one of those other like I've been saying before, low hanging fruit compounds that should be hitting the market, you know, um, in a relatively short period of time, um, since it's extremely promising and um, and I think you know company here, I mean, um, disclaimer or non-disclaimer, I'm not affiliated with this company whatsoever in any, any form, but um, if they get this out onto the, onto the market in a bioavailable form, which they certainly seem to be suggesting over here, uh, it seems like a really, really good thing because it's not, um, you know, pomegranate extract isn't going to work for everybody as not only their research has shown, but other researchers have shown. And um, and it's been attributed quite uh, convincingly to um, the difference in a gut microbiome. You know, one workaround to that is obviously modifying your gut microbiome, but you know, that's, that's, um, that's a bit more of a stretch than just going ahead and just taking urolithin A. So, um, mm -hmm. so I, I, based on this one paper, you know, I, I would feel confident in being one of the first users of, of, this, of this compound. 
Well, I mean, all they're doing really in, in a roundabout way is cutting the middleman out, aren't they? Mm -hmm. The uh, the bacteria that you said with the unpronounceable name. Yeah. Um, although the ideal, obviously, would be to have a, a healthy micro, uh, microbiome and, you know, a diverse mix of uh, bacteria therein. And we, we, we've talked about it before, haven't we? Um, it's looking increasingly likely that the microbiome plays a significant role in aging so but yeah it's, it's interesting that they've decided to skip the microbiome complexity and just go straight to producing a, a synthesized the uh, metabolite and just I mean, cut to the chase you know i mean for 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 a company that's i mean for a market you know i'm not a business person but this is uh that's to me that's the that's the very logical direct route to getting something approved and in the market and um yeah and it's got an excellent safety profile, at least from everything that we've seen here published. So, um, uh, great. <laughs> yeah, a, a similar thing I can think of is uh, butyrate as well, which is, uh, of course, another um, uh, metabolite, which is a short chain fatty acid produced by gut bacteria as well. And that's implicated in aging too. So, you know, that's another interesting approach. Could be a good combination. Yeah. So, yeah. So as I've said in the past, I, I think, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm very excited to see these types of excellent safety profile compounds that are very simple and being, you know, have a lot of great research behind them and, you know, shown to have great bioavailability. Um, and, and we now have a really, you know, we're getting a really deep understanding as to the mechanisms of these, you know, maybe not all the tar compounds that they, not all the factors that they target, but the biochemistry in, in our body and seeing this stuff hit the market, um, you know, because this is kind of a, this is kind of, this is a first time that this, that we're seeing um, kind of a conjunction of all of these things coming together and hopefully getting out to the consumer marketplace soon. I also wonder, of course, in uh, children with like mitochondrial diseases, if you could potentially see any more significant effect or something from these compounds. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, I haven't done a Google search. I haven't gone to PubMed, but you know, since this is this is already the the processed compound and it's active, I mean, it would be very straightforward to do an in vitro test, right? To, to basically look at cells that are from individuals that have uh, my, mitochondrial mitochondria mitochondria um, you know, basically defects in mitochondrial, you know, um, mitochondriogenesis defects in various mitochondrial defects and seeing if these compounds, just putting it into a Petri dish, do they work? Do they help in some sort of way? Um, they it might already be published papers on this. I haven't, I haven't done a, a, a look. Uh, Chris Linnell, anyone heard of any companies which could test your microbiome and tell you what you've got? We had a panel discussion on this. I think the short answer was no. Not it's very biome. difficult. Yeah, <laughs> Not new biome, folks. Yeah. So the, the the answer the answer to that was, and I think I asked that question directly, and and the answer was really no. You have to. It's complicated to really kind of get um, to find out specific species and and whatnot. Mm. However. That's looking at the entire microbiome. If you're looking for a specific microbe that's in your gut, like the microbe in this case that breaks down or that converts um, the precursors that form urolithin A, that should be pretty straightforward. If you know what microbes you're looking for in your gut, you can probably tailor a panel you know, that's PCR-based or, you know, or basically have a, have a chip that can say, do you have these proper... These, Health, these microbes that you would need to have in your gut. Um, if somebody's listening out there, I've probably given them the idea to start such a company because I don't think such a company exists that, that does that um, to look for, let's say, you know, does, you know, you can do a PCR action to test if you have a Gordonibacter urolithin of fashion, but I don't think there's a company out there that does that right now. What about Wyom? I mean, you have the famous Wyom company. Which company? Sure. Biome? Biome. Um, I don't know. There's companies that can test your microbiome. They can tell, tell you what genuses of, of microbes there are. They can tell you a certain profile, but um, 
I'm not sure if they can tell you they're looking right now for specific microbes that are associated with specific biochemical reactions. Like, I'm, I'm just guessing that the person asking this question is particularly focused on, you know, a microbe that will, you know, break down epigaltins into, into urolithin A. And um, any one of these companies that do this microbiome analysis, I would be surprised if they didn't start offering something like that pretty soon, because it's just a matter of probing DNA. And all you need to do is just put the right probes there that are specific uh, for that, you know, species of bacteria and don't have any, or have a very low rate of, of you know, of um, false positives. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of any company that does that. Yeah, you biome was um, the one that came to mind. They were actually looking at your uh, your poop to see what was in it, which is a, a, a apparently a, a way of doing it. Like Mike Mike was saying um, during our microbiome uh, webinar recently. But uh, I understand that they got into a bit of trouble with the FDA and such like uh, recently. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've been keeping up with that. But yes, there are companies yeah. that do, do the microbiome, but it's. Yeah. I don't think it's. For, for, for this specific application to look for this specific microbe, you know, that's not what they're doing. They're looking at a, a profile at the genus level of, of you know, that, that may correlate with, with healthy or sick individual or certain categories, but it's, but it's, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly, there are certainly labs that can get this sort of work done, but there's not really that I'm aware of a commercial kit, shall we say, you know, like an off the shelf kit that you can purchase, you know, like an ancestry kit. But, you know, the prevalence of these things is becoming ever increasingly more common. So as Oliver suggested earlier, I mean, it, it may happen sooner or later that you'll be able to buy a whole range of these diagnostics a lot easier. It certainly seems to be the, the direction we're going, you know. Um, you, I mean, what, what can you test these days commercially? Epigenetic profiles, uh, DNA. I mean, these things 10 years ago, you, you wouldn't have been able to do them at all uh, over the counter. You just wouldn't have been able to do it. It was something that would have required proprietary equipment and you would have to know somebody in a laboratory or work in the industry yourself to get it done. So. I think there's every chance, given people are becoming more focused on microbiomes, that these services are going to become more common. Um, you know, optimize your gut, health, yeah. nutrition. It, it's the it's the hot thing, isn't it? Yeah. And especially, especially, you know, you have to know what you're looking for because I think the identification of the bacteria that that converted um, those compounds to uro, urolithin A. It's it's pretty it's a pretty recent paper. I can go look for it, but it's so you know, um, ten years ago, I don't think they knew what the micro was. I'm, I may be mistaken about that, but uh, but so you, you know, so you got you got to know what you're looking for in order for this to be effective. So, but now now that we potentially know what we're looking for, then then yeah, perhaps you could uh, you know you might be one of the lucky people that can rapidly process you know all of these compounds into urolithin A. And great, you can, you can, you might not need your A. you might be able to get away with just drinking lots of pomegranate juice and lots of pomegranate extract. But, you know, it's just like, it's, it sort of reminds me of cancer diagnostics, right? Which is the proper diagnostic can tell you whether or not something works or not, right? So, you know, and that can account for some of this variability where, you know, people say, well, you know, some people have been taking pomegranate juice and it doesn't work. It's all bunk. And some people are like, well, I'm, I'm having great effects. And it, it comes down to individual, not only individual biochemistry, but individual gut microbiome biochemistry. And, and that, may, that may provide an explanation for also problems with repeatability, right? Maybe certain ethnicities have a microbiome profile that's optimized for, you know, for the processing of certain, that's completely possible because you live in, people live in different geographies, right? And you, and, and you have a different mi microbiome that you're going to, and people have already shown that this happens. Your microbiome changes if you move to some someplace else. So, and this is like just really early stages. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of complexity here, but people are, the scientific community and slowly the medical community is becoming hip to this and, um, <clears throat> and people are, are looking in the right places. 
Yeah, I mean, for example, I'd be interested in looking at the microbiome of people that live in Turkey or uh, or Greece. Um, I, 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 I've been to Turkey quite a few times, and I remember quite vividly that pomegranates, uh, they're, they're everywhere. They're, they're, grown, they're growing wild. You can, you can walk along the street and, you know, you can see uh, trees full of pomegranates in the summer and you can, you know, no, they don't belong to anyone. They're just growing wild. So you can imagine that pomegranates are a central part of the, the Turkish diet. So it'd be interesting to see if there's more people there who have that, those kinds of bacteria. I go out on a limb and say there probably is. Yeah. And it's an evolutionary kind of yin and yang, right? Because if you if you if if you evolve genes to basically promote the growth of a microbiome that's beneficial to you, you're gonna leave more offspring. So and then so your microbiome can, you know, basically can shape the population the dynamics of uh, you know, so microbiome plays a big role, but it could also it could also be that there are certain factors in your own, you know, different populations, guts that may promote a particular microbiome to, to, to thrive. So I don't know, hmm. it, it, it can get very complicated very quickly, but uh, people, people are, are, you know, are being, are now really aware that our whole bodies are, <laughs> are a jungle, both from our immune system to our gut microbiome to, the interior of our cells or, you know, which basically our, our mitochondria have been co-opted as free living entities, you know. Yeah, it's also if anyone is consuming pomegranates to the level that they really benefit from the urolithin A, you know. Yeah. Um, well, perhaps, right. Because they, they said that like 3% of the people in this trial, like already had really high, whatever the, it's somewhere in the supplemental high levels of urolithin A in their blood. Mm. So, so, you know, whatever, so somehow or another they're you know, I don't think they're eating a truckload of strawberries and pomegranates every day. They probably have a highly efficient microbiome or, you know, something's happening there. And it's no. not just pomegranates, is it? I mean, there are yeah. a number of foods. There's also, uh, I understand, strawberries, uh, raspberries, and hey, here's the weird one, walnuts. Walnuts. Apparently walnuts have got this, uh, this in it as well. And they, I think these compounds were initially identified in, in certain mammals. And um, I think I'll, I'll throw, out, throw out another bizarre one, uh, tree bark, and I think, and I think uh, oak leaves. Mm. So things that have a lot of tannins. I think um, so. They have a lot of they have a lot of these polyphenolic compounds that then get converted to urolithin A. So maybe high tannic teas, maybe I don't know. Yeah, and, I mean, it could could possibly be a tea that contains that particular tannin or those that particular group of tannins, isn't it? Right. The um, the group of tannins you mentioned that begins with an E that I can't even begin to pronounce. Yes. Um, it, no, I'm not even going to try now because it. But if you look at compounds like fyrocetin, yeah. I mean, you need to eat such absurd amounts of strawberries to get the senolytic dosage. I mean, but mm. then. Yeah. But again, is that is that also due to how they're being processed? I mean, certainly you could say that about. I mean, the microbiome is influencing how we react to all kinds of drugs and compounds. So, yeah, and it, it definitely uh, reinforces that there is no one single drug that works the same on anybody because we're all different. And knowing what we know about the microbiome, that makes it ever more obvious. But getting back to the paper, that's they, they decided to pole vault over that and just say, well, if urolithin A is the compound, let's ignore the microbiome for now. Let's just have purified urolithin A and see if it works. And um, at least, you know, it's very promising. Um, good for them. They, you know, they, they seem to really do a very thorough study. I mean, obviously somebody could say, well, you know, we have to take a look at the physiology and do these people run faster. But, you know, yes, of course we're going to do these things. But, um, but first things first, it is bioavailable. It's safe, and at least the mitochondrial profile seems to go up in a very favorable direction. 
So that tells me that uh, everything else is going to be promising um, as far as this compound. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about your look today. So uh, can we can we nail you down here, as, if we can, any scientist? Are we going to tentatively say that we think that this might be a gero protector, an actual true gero protector? What do we think? Are we are we willing to sort of say maybe or? Yeah, I'll say I'll say that I'll say anything that improves improves your um, your body's ability to repair itself. You know, you put that into the gero protector category because your body's repair capabilities go down as you age, and some people have the ability to keep them up, and having these supplements that can allow the rest of us to get those levels back up, you know, that's, that's gero protection. I mean, um, again, these compounds are not going to make you immortal or live you yeah. have lived to a thousand years or go beyond whatever your, you know, what your system is, is, is trying to fight against entropy. But I think what these compounds will do and the data certainly bears it out is it's going to give you an, a extra health span so it's going you know probably give maybe i don't know if it's going to give you a more maximal health span but it's certainly well, the lifespan but it's certainly going to i think it will and but i think just as importantly it's going to um make you live healthier longer which is um just as important yeah and it, it, it echoes back from uh what we listened to at berlin as you remember if you remember the debate between aubrey de gray and uh, yeah. Vadim uh, Gladyshev, uh, where they actually, uh, Vadim proposed that there are three types of interventions and they've all got merit. And he all, he said the repair strategies, he said the rejuvenation or the reprogramming strategies. And he also said gero protectors also have their place. And I think that this could be a, um, a case. There's a lot of snake oil and nonsense and not supported re, uh, supplements and it's got a bad rap. But I think some of them do have an actual, you know, potential to be gero protectors, and they've got a valid place in 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 what we're doing. Yeah, and and I and I like this paper again because it hit all the three parts that I was looking for. Number one, is it have a good safety profile? Number two, is this compound bioavailable? And then num and and once you know that, then you can go on to the third thing, which is, is it working right? And they, they focus just on, on mitochondrial function. And in that very narrow slice, you know, with the variability, the caveat that there's all this variability, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I kind of like, I, you know, I really like it for that. And, and I like to see more papers where they focus on bioavailability and pharmacokinetics and to make sure that, you know, that your compound actually is floating around in your plasma and, and getting to where it needs to go. So you don't accidentally throw something out that may be effective, but it's, it's just not in the right form. So um, it's very promising that urolithin A, again, I, I read through the materials and methods. I didn't know exactly what the capsule formulation was, but whatever formulation it was, it seems that you don't have to come up with a derivative of urolithin A. You don't have to, we don't have to start figuring out, well, we need to put a methyl group to have it pass through the, it seems just, just urolithin A in this capsule form works. So that's really promising. So there you go. Food for thought really on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I, I wrote an article on the, um, on the website over at leaf about this uh, today as well. So yeah, there we are. It does look, that it might well be a gero protector. And I'm excited to see what other legit gero protectors are out there. And now we're getting to the stage where we're doing human trials. We might find some real gems. So, you know, every little helps, as Oliver was saying. It's not going to make you immortal, but it could help you live healthier and longer, potentially, while better things arrive. And that was the point that Vadim was also making that Gero protectors have their place. So yeah, more of these trials, more of the science um, to establish whether they are valuable or not and less of the snake oil. That's what I say. I think it'll be hugely interesting with, uh, with like online forums where people gather all their anecdotal evidence of these kind of interventions. Well, I mean, there already is a place for that. You can, uh, if people are interested in, in doing that and sharing some of their experiences, longevity is a, 
a, a suitable place. Um, th there's quite a lot of self-experimenting or biohacking or supplement taking. You know, people do frequently share their personal stories and anecdotes. Make of them what you will, but longevity is a is a, a good place to check out if you're interested in that side of things. And that's and that's one of the blogs I actually not blogs, but I think message posts I looked at was in longevity um, when I was reading about this in 2018. Um, somebody, a guest who goes by went by the acronym of Daniel Cooper, which I think is the guy that the FBI was looking for who jumped out of an airplane over Alaska. But anyway, that's an aside. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's the real Daniel Cooper. Um, they, they, they were discussing supplementation with urolithin A, and this is well before this trial came out. And people were, that's where people were also discussing Gordonibacter urolithin fashions as a possible probiotic. Um, so people have been talking about this on these message boards for quite some time now. Um, this one is dated july of 2018 so almost exactly a year ago right so you know um people people on these some of these message boards are ahead of the curve and are plugged in and are um you know so if you want to kind of eavesdrop on this chatter or participate um longevity is one of them yeah. um and yeah so, you know, but as with as with any biohacking, if you're going to, you know, do it properly, then obviously you need to take biomarkers and there's all sorts of things. But longevity is a good place to get familiar with how to get into it if you're new to the topic. So, you know, and I'm not being paid by Caliban at longevity to promote him today, honestly, although he's a friend of mine. But, yeah, it, it is a, a useful place and I've, I've enjoyed you know, I've enjoyed reading things on there and, you know, I'm a great believer in, you know, citizen science. So, yeah. So uh, sign me up for this, this product when it comes out. I'll, uh, I'm interested. And there's a paper out there. This, this paper here cites a lot of other work that have, has looked at your A, I believe. And they looked at, uh, uh, so a paper by Gong et al. in Journal of Neuroinflammation, for example, urolithin A attenuates memory impairment and neuroinflammation in, in the Alzheimer's, you know, uh, mice that, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the transgenic mice. So, um, so yeah, so if, if it is, if it is targeting key pathways that are at the root cause of, you know, uh, you know, uh, or at the, basically at the root of promoting, um, promoting cellular repair then you know then these are legitimate geroprotectors and they should have wide-ranging effects against a lot of um you know a lot of uh problems that it sells um and manifest as diseases of aging not just you know mitochondrial um defects but also alzheimer's cardiovascular so on and so forth and i think urolithin a probably fits that bill yeah there's certainly uh exciting things so yeah we we look forward to um you know their next publication because they're saying uh, that the researchers are saying a little bit more uh, studying needs to happen obviously but they are keen to try and get that to market as soon as possible which is quite understandable mm -hmm. um so yeah i i definitely um i definitely consider it and you know great so yeah Keep your eyes on that one. We'll obviously update the uh, blog if they uh, publish again. Yep. Um, I think we, I think it was a couple of years ago we we first published about uh, pomegranates and, and and this particular compound. So yeah, it's getting there. So there we go. So mm, exciting, and it's a very exciting um, time in general, isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, we're all. There's, there just seems to be a lot going on and uh you know i know oliver has um got a lot going on next month not too long now in another what 20 days is it and you're you're going to be in the hot seat at, um at the conference yeah well some some panels i don't i think we've got a, a bunch of other moderators i but uh but we're gonna we have an exciting lineup of people 
and um, do do go on on our website and uh, and check out all the names and all the talent that we have there. And um, it's it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be huge. Um, and um, so yeah, if you want to know what's going on in the world of aging research, we've got about 30, 32, 33 um, industry leaders. Uh, from research and biotech business, uh, stretched over two days in New York. Uh, I've put the link in the uh, the chat there, but it, it looks set to be a really good conference. Um, so if you're interested in coming along, I know Oliver will be there and Victor will be there, you lucky guys. I wish I could come over, but uh, it's a little bit expensive for, for, for me at this time. So I shall be there in uh, spirit. But uh, it's twenty. It's only twenty days to go. So if you're interested, do check out the link. Uh, I definitely think it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a good event. And you know, and there's some pretty interesting stuff going to be uh, revealed. But I can't say any more than that because uh, I think the FBI would, uh, would would have to arrest me. It's that exciting. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Oliver's muted himself. Hold on. You're out of, I think you're out of their jurisdictions. Probably Scotland Yard. Scotland. What is it with you guys in Scotland Yard? I don't know. It's it's. You, you watch Sherlock Holmes, and everybody thinks everything that happens at Scotland Yard. Well, yeah, th yeah. That's Sherlock Holmes runs Scotland Yard, right? That's what we all think here in the states. Sort it's of. Uh, it's complicated. Oh, okay. It's complicated. Oh, okay. Although obviously uh, Scotland Yard is 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 very important here. It's not something you know. I don't think it has quite the same gravitas as as some of the American um, institutions, should we say? I mean, everyone everyone knows the FBI and the CIA, and we we just don't have the same glamour, you know. And we don't tend to appear in the movies as much with Scotland Yard. It's, it's just it's just a branding problem. Just hi, hire somebody from McKinsey Consulting and get it fixed. You need a, just a new logo or something. I don't. know. Well, we do have James Bond, to be fair. So I think I think, I think we can be forgiven. And we've got Mr. Bean. So, yeah. you know, Mr. Bean is uh, popular. And what, what's, what's the other character he does? Oh, Johnny English. That was uh, quite popular. I think it was Johnny English, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, when, I, of... when, I, when I was growing up, it was Benny Hill. Benny Hill. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to tell you a fun fact here. This is, this is an actual true fact. I was nearly named Benny, right? Because my parents thought Benny Hill was hilarious, and of course, I was nearly named Benny Hill. So there you go, true fact. Wait, you 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 know, if, you came very close to, to being dressed as Benny Hill for Halloween for the, for every. I year. did, and so I dodged the bullet there. And the other weird, weird, random fact about me is, at school, at middle school. So when I was about, I don't know about between sort of 10 and I think it's about 10 and 12 or nine and 12 years old. I can't remember, but my middle school nickname uh, very strangely was actually Aubrey. So how weird. So there we go. So there we go. So anyway, anyway, I think the conclusion is we're excited about this particular metabolite. Mm -hmm. I think you should be excited as well. Keep an eye on, on developments. Uh, do check out the uh, conference, and I think that's about it, isn't it? And yep, and we'll see you. We'll see you in a few weeks. So we'll uh, and and we'll uh, we'll get all the videos and all the good stuff up as soon as oh, we yeah. can, and let everybody know what what went down. What went down? What went it's, down? Uh, yeah, what went, went down? We'll give you the we'll give you the down low and what everything was going on and yeah. something like that. But yeah, we'll be releasing some of the videos, not all, but some of them. Obviously, some of the videos at the conference are going to be you know not for public consumption uh, yet but we'll we'll release what we can and uh, regards the journal club thanks very much for everyone who joined us today and as always we'd like to thank the lifespan heroes um who are our monthly patrons who make this show possible and many other shows like the x10 show and the other things that we do they make that possible so thanks very much to everyone who's supporting us and if you're interested in supporting us do visit uh, lifespan.io forward slash heroes we will see you next time um, we're not quite sure when because the conference 
but we'll announce on the website when the next journal club is and that's it stay healthy and we'll uh, we'll see you next time all right take care stay healthy live long and prosper <laughs>